I really want to thank uh, the Red House for hosting this. Uh, we really, we couldn't have done it without the Red House doing a lot of things here, displays on the wall. So please, thank the Red House. You know, the conference, part of the conference is, uh, is the history, you know, and so much of the history of the Tibetan history is not known, I mean, not known to the broader world, uh, certainly not in the Western world, um, and the Chinese are very, very consistent, at least in putting forth a very single position, which is Tibet as a part of China, and always has been, and, you know, it's important that that, that claim, which has no basis in fact, but nevertheless, they figured out that if you keep saying it again and again, somebody's going to believe it at some point, even if there's no basis in it. And Mao learned that, you know, you can, if you lie a thousand times, at some point somebody's going to believe you. You know, if you keep lying and your lie is consistent. So these kinds of conferences are very important to, uh, to demonstrate that all of that claim is, is really, has no basis at all, completely fallacious. So, Question, uh, first is any questions that we have had so far from our internet viewers? Okay. Any questions from our audience here for the panelists uh, about the history of Canada? I have one question for John Miller, which is, uh, what about the, I, I read, there was something interesting in an essay that you wrote um, just prior to the opening of the show here, as I was thinking about these issues, where you talked about how, and it, it, was, a, it was a pattern, how when the communists were taking over uh, China, and when Kuomintang was taking over when the Roman and the Manchu Empire, they started by being an ethnically nationalist type of movement, an ethnically nationalist type of propaganda. <laughs> Kuomintang uh, uh, changed their flag, first one was on, so as to consolidate China, before they launched into making claims about only the sort of peoples around them. And I would just be interested in your thoughts on, at that time, this sort of how they dealt with uh, you know, modifying their propaganda first, you know, internal and then slightly more external, you know, to include Tibet, for example. Well, actually, they did it, you know, with absolutely no shame. The, the changes that they made to their propaganda, first thing, when they invaded Tibet, they didn't talk about the old Tibetan people's society or anything of the sort. They just said they wanted to liberate Tibet from British. You know, and uh, uh, Western imperialism, American imperialism. That was all. But after they came to Tibet, in fact, there was a you know a little honeymoon period when um, even this uh, Alan Willing, uh, one of the you know the first kind of left wing journalists who came to Tibet in 1956, he was told by the communists that you know actually that uh, you know the Tibet aristocrats, even compared to people in the West, are the poor. The communists really not only want to help the Tibetan peasants and the nomads, but even the Tibetan aristocracy. Because the Tibetan aristocrats would rather have a job as a manager of a, of a power plant than do what he's doing. It sounds ridiculous, but they're actually books. But then the thing is, it changed after, you know, this propaganda changed depending on the circumstances. Because initially, uh, they needed the aristocracy. They, they needed, because they didn't have enough troops in Pakistan. You know, they're a bit nervous about what would happen, so they, you know, be careful. But after 59, then it changed, overnight it changed. Then there was the denunciation of, you know, the reactionary uh, Dalai Peak and uh, reactionary you know, law, you know, and, and all this kind of propaganda about people's hands being cut and you know, this and that, and all this stuff. So the thing is, it's constantly evolving. In the, in the 1980s, you know, just after, when the first kind of, uh, uh, let's say, the, the Chinese attempted to reach out to the Tibetans in exile, at that time, the Dalai Lama was, you know, and this is the official term we used, that he was a good man. It was only few people in the pay of, you know, American right. CIA, blah, blah, uh, who were instigating uh, this uh, split between the Chinese people, you know, you know Han people and the Tibetan people. So, I mean, at the moment, and of course, His Holiness felt that there was an opportunity they saw in that way. 
but now of course he's a woman, she's clothing, blah, blah, you know, whatever. So uh, my whole uh, point in this is, even if they insult you, it doesn't mean anything. Even if they praise you, it doesn't mean anything. You know, you just have to focus on your own uh, issues and your cause and go ahead on this. So I just think, don't, I don't think Tibet should keep the honest their ear cocked to what the Chinese leaders are saying about us. Uh, so you don't think there's an attraction then in, in, in interpreting their current line of propaganda? You know, that there's, there's no, there's no, no it's, there is only attraction in interpreting in, in order to see what's going on in China itself within their leadership, you know. Uh, it's like more, you know, like uh, those old time Scientologists would do it. You try to see what new uh, policies they've implemented, what changes in the power structure taking places, and you try to read in between the lines of whatever confirmation they make. So in that sense, it's interesting, but not in a sense that we should, uh, you, know, you know, just take what the Chinese are saying and then, you know, get hopeful or feel depressed, but, you know, whatever it may be. So I think Tibetans have to be really wary of this. We are in it for the long term, for the long haul. And you know, we shouldn't be in any way sort of allow ourselves to be you know, discouraged or encouraged by what Chinese leaders say. And just now, at the, at the present moment, there's this guy called Xi Jinping, you know, the Chinese leader. And there's a lot of hope in the Tibetan world about him. Because at one point, he was involved in Ando in the pacification of the, the great uprising in 19, starting from day 49, going on for three years. Huge fighting there. In fact, the Chinese even called it, uh, you know, they called it Little Taiwan. And he was involved in the pacification. He managed to get uh, Amdo Lama, the like Shirab Gyatso, to go and negotiate. Finally, they managed to get some of the leaders and they negotiated. And these people surrendered. Mao Zedong was so impressed with this guy. You know, you know, now I think summoned him down to Beijing. He summoned the Tibetan leader. So it's all there. It's all come out in Chinese documents. But then the Tibetans say maybe because he's dealt peacefully with this guy, but they don't realize that you know, after they dealt peacefully, these people surrendered. Then the next year, the, the, the democratic reform started. Everyone was locked up again. And this time they didn't have their weapons because they had given it up to China. And they all wiped out. There's an account of this, and the person managed, one person managed to feed Hassa from uh, Namra. And he said, in the end, what was left in Namra or Muka, he said, there were a few old people, some children, <coughs> blind people, and the village idiots. That's all that was left there. So I think, I think the Tibetans also have to realize that, like, whatever the leadership changes take place, also, we shouldn't sort of. Or maybe this leaders a liberal, you know, every organization, you know, there will be differences in the personality of the leaders. That doesn't mean that, you know, it's going to in any way affect the overall direction in which they push their policy. Thank you. The question in the back. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's Xi Jinping's father, sorry. Mm -hmm. Was he eventually humble and humiliated because he was kind to the No, 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 that's, that's a big myth. That's a myth? That's a myth. That's a myth. Uh, that's yeah. um, <coughs> so my question is, uh, well, when I tell everyone that I'm Tibetan, the first thing they ask me is, what will happen in the post, uh, it's only next to the Dalai Lama? And I, I can never answer that question, so my question to each panelist is what scenario do you imagine we could see in the post Lama and uh, how would it impact the Tibetan world stage and how would it impact the Tibetan movement as a whole? So the, uh, the question is, uh, for those who can hear, the impact, what impact? How would it shape uh, in the... Uh, shape the... the Scenario do you imagine or will, uh, I guess, materialize after uh, this one has been uh, Assuming Tibet is still under China's rule. Yes, assuming uh, all else being able. I know it's speculative, but does anybody want to address that? I think it's an the question is uh, do you have any thoughts about the impact if this holiness passes away before any kind of 
the resolution to the Tibetan issue, either through the middle way or through Rome, is achieved, and the status quo is the same, but His Holiness has passed away. Um, the question is, you know, how do you see that impacting on this on the Tibetan movement? I know it's a bit speculative, but if you want to go first, or anyone else give a crack? The wonderful thing about speculation is, uh, you know, we can say whatever, and later there's no real sort of uh, downside to it. So if I'm wrong, you can sue me, and uh, as a result, get to bed back. But I think you know, the Dalai Lama certainly is a charismatic leader, unlike a few others on the planet today. And there's nobody in the Tibetan community anywhere as charismatic. That's, so in that way, he's irreplaceable. Uh, having said that, uh, I personally have two great hopes. The first is that uh, Tibet gets a, a much uh, more success in their efforts before he passes away. They've got about another maybe 20 years or something on that score. So hopefully, um, the visions of the, the people, the, the work, the people's working so hard for Tibet will be successful for that, before that. And of course, the Dalai Lama's own hope to uh, go back to Tibet before he dies, and the hopes of all the people in Tibet to see the Dalai Lama before he dies. And that said, hopefully, uh, Tibetans are very intelligent peoples. So hopefully within themselves, they will make the kind of leadership that will continue the effort uh, for Tibetan complete independence. <laughs> uh, before he passes, his holiness passes away, and he will be able to go back. And who knows, there are other very charismatic leaders may emerge, but you know, I think he's kind of irreplaceable as a person. And he's dissolved again in Potram, he said, which I think is a little bit of a, a confusing issue. But I think amongst the Tibetans themselves, especially the young, younger Tibetans, there's really great strength, great intelligence, great education. And some of their leaders, like uh, well, Zhang Yangla and other great thinkers, uh, have, well, he, he may not look like a, like a Clint Eastwood, but he's going to come through as the hero in the end. <laughs> I don't have any like maybe to talk to my chair. Right <laughs> but on this issue, I, I wrote an article. I was asked by Newsweek uh, at one point, you know, what's going to happen after the Dalai Lama passes away? And I wrote something which uh, became controversial for Tibetan society because, you know, like the way Glenn put it here, of course, when the Dalai Lama dies, you know, he's to a certain extent irreplaceable, although I don't like to use that term. It's undemocratic. No one is irreplaceable. But um, what I said was, it, you know, you have to look at the positive side. It may do some good in that community. You know, at the moment, everything hinges around what he says. You know, even when he doesn't say, our body should go out to him, you know, to ask him to make a statement on certain issues, and then they use it in some ways to justify their actions. So what happens always is that um, any real effort, any real dialogue, completely stops. So I said, finally, maybe Tibetans have to take some responsibility for their own uh, uh, community and the government. So it might, if he's not there, then they'll be, they'll be forced to. And at the same time, I think Tibetans should all remember that we are a very old, not only a nation, but an empire. There was Tibet before the Dalai Lama. <coughs> there were earlier even Lama uh, kings of Tibet. The Sakyas. He was already there as a monkey. And then <laughs> the times of the you know, Tibetan emperors as well. So I think we, we have a culture, we have a kind of historical memory, which I think will allow the Tibetans to create. And I think this time, more importantly, not only just rely on charismatic personalities, but to build institutions which last so I think uh, there is a, you know, again, this is speculation, but I'm hoping that if we move in that direction, in the way that uh, you know, all sensible, democratic, modern countries do, you know, we'd be forced to do that, but I think there is some, at least there is the beginning of some hope for the Tibetan world. I, I think that as well as himself agrees with you, Jeff, 
and I think that's why he resigned from ruling the government. And I think that's why he insisted that his future incarnation will not hold any kind of political office. And he really thinks it's up to the defendants to reconcile their own conflicts, take up their own. I actually had a debate with him that I thought that he should remain a kind of constitutional lama. Uh, but he said, he said no. People don't want, didn't want to do that. He said, I don't want to be a prisoner like Lady Di. So he <laughs> said to me. And, uh, and I didn't completely agree with him because of the importance of spirituality. You know, because democracy, an idealized democracy tends to become plutocracy. You know, money tends to control and vile parliaments and things. So anyway, that was my argument. But I think he is agreeing with you in that it's time for the bit to do that. However, uh, the last thing I would say is that the Dalai Lama will definitely outlive the Chinese communist dictatorship, no question about it. And so that's clearly not going to be a problem. But there will probably be some other crappy government there, but the Dalai Lama will outlive them, I'm certain of it. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. What happens? With the mic. Uh, we talked about the contacts between Tibet and the spirit of 1913 and 1915, China, Britain, and the US. Are there any other nations that had some? Uh, significant contact with Tibet in this period that has had some historical significance that we should mention, whether it was Japan, Germany, or some other. Russia! Russia. Is there anything you want to mention about the. Yeah, the Russian. The whole frenzy of the British in invading in 1904, and their whole freak out of handing Tibet to the Chinese had to do with their fear of the Russian. The Great Game and so on. And the Russians, they had the second betrayal, maybe that was the third one. The Glen Street Betrayal was where the British handed Mongolia and Siberia to the Russians in exchange for uh, letting the Chinese keep Tibet and themselves doing some other things. So they made some deal like that. But I forget which convention that was, but that was another one. 1907, the Anglo Russian. 1907, the Anglo Russian convention. After the Russians had been beaten up by the Japanese. So the, but the Russians, uh, the Buddhology and the Tibetology of the Russians in the earlier period was way ahead of the Western Europeans. And uh, certainly the uh, you know, tutor, the Kembo Dorjan, uh, was made of treaties, sort of kind of agreement between the Tsar Nicholas and, uh, and the Sergei Dalai Lama. And the presence of Russia was an important thing. Unfortunately, the Brits you know, defeated the, the effort by the Sergei Dalai Lama to bring Russia in to balance the power of China and uh, Mongolia. Because you know, in doing his normal diplomacy inherited from the fifth Dalai Lama, of keeping the different mundane powers outside of Tibet balanced against each other so as to preserve Tibet's freedom. And uh, it failed in that case because Russia didn't take a strong enough interest as a, as a polity, uh, and the Brits also pushed them out of the, of the, out of the game. But, it, but the Russian role, and the Russian role in the future is very important because the Mongolian role will become important in the future. Uh, the Mongolia is still, is now a recognized country. It is a temporarily free, the Chinese do not acknowledge its freedom. Chinese people in small schools teach that Mongolia belongs to China and it was ripped off by Stalin. And they don't acknowledge Mongolia, our Mongolia is independent. But it is still free and it is turning back toward Buddhism somewhat, not completely, but it's turning back to Buddhism enough to let Glenn live there. And Glenn will have the benign influence, I'm sure, if he stays there longer. And so, but Russia will have a big, big role. And, uh, um, the Buryat Mongols, the Kalmyks, the Tuvans, they are all Buddhists and supporters of the Dalai Lama. So Russia is a very important and sort of unknown element to us, you know, uh, but, but they're very important. There is a story, what do you know about that, Jamal, that in the time, in the more recent time, when the Chinese first came into Tibet, that they owed Russia a lot of money and they paid them with Tibetan gold. They stole a lot of gold from Tibet and they made a big payment to Stalin at that time. There is a story of this effect, but nobody's really properly documented it that I know of. But I've heard this story, and I wonder if you've ever heard about it or looked into it. It was a huge payment that Mao owed to Stalin, and he paid it with Tibetan gold. This is a story. Uh, you know that Chinese writer, uh, Jun Tan, who wrote a lot of songs, she wrote a biography of Mao, and she mentioned that Mao, just before the, the invasion, uh, he, traveled, he traveled to to Russia, he asked Stalin for help, especially for air, um, transport aircraft, because uh, the road from uh, Chengdu up to Kansai, then to Tibet, it's 
you know, like it's so difficult for them to get supplies. So find this Stalin did send a lot of uh, Russian planes, yeah. and they really helped during the invasion. Uh, so some of the payment may have come for that, but at the same time, what is really known, you know, is that not only just gold, you know, I hear about the school, but in those days, especially in the Eastern Bloc, in Russia, and then in Romania, a lot of the Eastern Bloc countries, their uh, agriculture you know, had gone to the dogs because of, you know, Lysenko and his theories. Mm -hmm. So much of the food that was coming to feed these people were coming from Tibet and from China itself. One of the reasons, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons for the, uh, the mass starvation, the famine in China was also, you know, they deliberately took food from Tibet, China, and shipped them up to pay back for arms and for a lot of the, uh, the arms you know, that the Chinese are acquiring from uh, the Russians. It was used in that. It was totally cynical. So in that sense, the great famine of China was not just an accident. It didn't happen because of bad weather or, you know, it was a deliberate policy by Bob, mm -hmm. you know, to pay back whatever he owed the Russians. Uh, by starting the and starting mostly Chinese. Okay. Uh, before I forget, I just want to mention um, there were two papers to write two uh, Tibet scholars that couldn't participate. Uh, Tashi Tseren, Tashi Tseren, uh, and Tsewon Nobu. Um, we, we were going to discuss them here, but uh, I think for time and reasons, what we're going to do is they're eventually going to be available uh, on the uh, Ramzen Alliance website, ramzen.net. Ramzen so keep checking that, uh, and they should be available for, for download now. Uh, other questions? Wasn't there some kind of statement made by Chairman Mao that his biggest foreign debt was with Tibet, and that that would be like one of the first things he did was to pay it back? Yeah, the, the, uh, so the question is, uh, was there a statement by Mao that uh, the Communist Party's biggest foreign debt, you talk about during the long, long, long march, was to the to Tibetans. And he referred to it as foreign debt. And he referred to it as foreign debt. Yeah, it's Edgar Sloan. It's, uh, this quote is from uh, Edgar Sloan's book. You know, Red Cloud over China. Red Cloud over China. Red over China. And uh, the problem, I think, was also, we have to be very careful of this was the interpretation of what he said at the time. And he was a journalist with yeah, his command of Chinese with Mark McCaskey. So, you know, whether Mao actually said it exactly the way he said it, uh, we don't know. But Mao did, and most of he did it because, uh, in, uh, but also he could have been sarcastic about it. You know what? Uh -huh. He was saying about paying back was because a lot of the Tibetans at that time massacred a lot of the red troops who came back, the covers. You know, one of them is, if you know Mr. Lodi Gary from ICT, his grandmother was involved in you know, killing a lot of uh, communist troops at that time. And then, uh, he, in that same quotation, at the end of it, he, he Mao talks of the Mansu Queen. So most probably he might have been referring to this Gary Chini Doma. So there was, uh, you know, of course, there was an idea that Tibet was not part of China. And even at that time when they came, they were coming to definitely a foreign country. So that, in that sense, uh, you know, Ma was being honest, but you know, the paying back, I think, was uh, meant in a much more nasty way. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. um, actually, the book Red Star Over China is translated into Chinese, and uh, they do have that uh, sentence in there. Two months ago, there was a, uh, a reference to it in the blog post by Tseri uh, Yosef, uh, and I translated that, which she posted in Chinese, and I translated that and put just, not the entire post, but the reference to the foreign debt, because I thought it was a, a, a very apt comment, and I put it on the Rungs and the Lions site. But anyway, the, the thing is that um, uh, Chairman Mao, was speaking to Edgar Snow, uh, um, talked about the fact that the Red Army had basically had to pillage from the Tibetans in order to make their way through Naba uh, as they were heading up north. And um, I think the term uh, in Chinese, when it was translated, is Waijai, and it really is a foreign debt. Um, you know, 
Uh, so regardless of Snow's uh, command in Chinese, this is the way they put it into the edition, but uh, as I had a very uh, uh, biting comment um, uh, when, when Chairman Mao said, this is our only foreign debt and we must pay, we must pay back the Tibetans. And uh, she said, and so how did they pay them back? Um, within 10 years, most of the tribes there were wiped out and today, this area is the site of most of the self immolations. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you have a question? I have a question. Well, yeah, all right. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, will we see a lot more collections? You know, from this discussion, you know, I'm getting the feeling they were almost at the peak um, of a place in uh, history in the Himalayan region where uh, the Tibetans may settle and get, or have to get used to the Chinese uh, occupation and the Chinese move, still moving in um, are, uh, you know, uh, the Tibetans are still being uh, imposed by, but is there a time frame or is there a situation politically that in our lives, as we are now, and of course, uh, His Holiness is, that we will be able to see a, a, a slowdown of some of the horrible things that we uh, uh, they, uh, live with and see in that region? Oh, I'll take that. I'm clairvoyant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the thing with the self immolations, unfortunately, is just that Tibetans are very frustrated. And uh, frustrated in a way, uh, I think, by the lack of a clear, progressive, objective strategy towards Tibet, uh, towards what they should do. I mean, your average Tibetan, I think, hasn't got a clue of how he or she can help Tibet, other than go to a March 10th demonstration and a Dalai Lama birthday party and maybe write the occasional letter to a congressman or something like that. The, there is very little clear-cut strategy on the part of uh, Tibetans in exile, I think, right now. Uh, there was until maybe seven, eight years ago, 10 years ago, it was much clearer, but it's, I think just become very frustrating for Tibetans inside and outside of Tibet. In Tibet, I think you did have some good leadership until the mid-90s and late 90s, but those uh, Tibetans now are unfortunately in a difficult situation. So I think a lot of Tibetans feel the self-immolation thing is one of the only ways they can make a statement. And I have a number of reasons for that hope. One is Vietnam. They saw how it shook up America among immolating themselves. And they have some hope that it will stir the international world. The second is during the Falun Gong crackdown in China. Uh, some of the Falun Gong self-immolated Falun Gong followers or students or whatever you want, practitioners. And that completely terrified the Chinese government, the Beijing government, uh, and led to a really very radical crackdown nationwide. Uh, you know, I go to Tibet quite a lot, and whenever I go to Tibet and things are very, very bad in Tibet, there's been hundreds of arrests or maybe a few thousand arrests, Tibetans are extremely cheerful. To them, this means China is now a little bit nervous. And, uh, you know, that's a good sign. I mean, the difficulty for Tibetans is the only way they can measure progress is through Chinese violence and Chinese atrocities. When Chinese, if China goes out and arrests 50,000 people like they did a couple of years ago and killed 4,000 of them in prison, all the Tibetans throughout Tibet are cheerful as an apple pie. It's like, wow, we're doing something right. You know, if China's not doing anything, it means they're very complacent and self-satisfied uh, in their position. So I think part of the immolation is to shake up China because they saw what it is for the Falun Gong. And they know that around the world, monks self-immolating or non-self-immolating uh, touches a nerve as well. So I think it's those two things. But I think it's mainly aimed at China, not aimed at the West, because it really, uh, they see it as the only way they can really shake the Chinese leadership in kind of emotion. <coughs> Do you want to say something? For me? I'm not the only clairvoyant one here, so Bob can say something clairvoyant. No, I didn't really want to 
would say, you know, I, I have said about these supplemental issues that uh, I think in most of the cases it can't be just you know categorized by us as a, as a normal response to the same. When someone does that, it's a kind of a heroic act that uh, nobody would recommend them to do. And in a way, they are not expecting a response because they're taking themselves out of the equation and out of the conflict. They're saying they are, they are, they are consenting to the back and forth struggle and they're, they're making themselves unreachable for an answer and they're asserting their freedom. I consider it, it's an assertion of freedom. Uh, you can't kill me, you can't bully me, you can't torture me because I can give up my body in this situation because I, I'm living in a reality beyond my body. And the way you're handling my body and your body is, uh, is confused and it's ignorant and it's wrong. And uh, I'm going, I'm giving my body to make that point in hopes that some people will wake up. But I'm not, it's not a protest against the rain in this way and it's not aimed, it's sort of beyond the aiming kind of level. It's just a gift. I think when you do some lesser things, protests or things, those, those can be aimed in a specific way. But when they actually are going to like kindle, swallow some gas, pour the rest of it over there, and blow themselves up, and have the air agonizing, excruciating, like 90 seconds or three, three minute agony, and then unconscious death, and then the bargain, I think it's somehow beyond. And I deeply revere them and admire them as great heroes and bodhisattvas. And some of them probably, I think, didn't quite realize what it was, and maybe they still in their level of like give and take. But this is really going beyond the whole thing, I think. And that's why it has power. It has this power because it is saying, this game of who's dominating and who's doing what, and how we're going to get it, and what are we doing, is this is wrong. It's illegitimate. It's, uh, you know, and the people have to completely rethink what they're doing. And um, I think it's one of it, the, the sign of the helplessness of the Chinese is like when somebody lights themselves and they burn then they start shooting them. They start beating them. They're saying like, no, you can't kill yourself. We're supposed to kill you. <laughs> and, uh, and oh, you could kill yourself if you were bombing us like a, like a suicide bomber. Then we'd understand that that's terrorism. We could just, but you're killing yourself without hurting us. So but that's really illegal. That's truly illegal. We're going to shoot you before you can die. <laughs> It shows the complete self-contradiction of that. Uh, of the there's no ability to respond to the feeling, except to change their own ways, ultimately. Uh, we're going to reserve the last question for Danola. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, this question is on behalf of uh, somebody else uh, who asked me to post this. Uh, it's about you know, going back to history, um, a lot of people discuss about the Nepali government's application to enter the UN in 1946 or something, and that application, uh, one of the uh, elements of that application being uh, that they had state-to-state -state relations with Tibet. And uh, wondering if the panelists might elaborate on that a little bit more, and if uh, those documentation are available anywhere today. Actually, this is uh, quite an interesting little snippet of history because uh, <coughs> this documentation is exactly from the 60s when the Nepalese government <coughs> made an application to the United Nations for a seat. And uh, in there, they stated the number of the different uh, treaties they had signed with sovereign nations. And of course, as the British, they have to say that, although they were not too happy because that they, had, they signed under the US, they lost the war. But they mentioned the uh, treaty with Tibet because they received a lot of privileges from that treaty, trading privileges, you know, and uh, so they did mention that they, they actually had, uh, you know, one of the, their uh, sort of, um, the reason why they were entitled to a seat in the United Nations was they did had uh, signed a treaty with uh, independent uh, nation state like Tibet. One of the problems with this treaty was just uh, 1800, yeah, it was the date of the uh, treaty, 1846, am I right? No, it's like 1850, so it's yeah. something. Yeah, I'm not good with dates. But the thing was, under this treaty, 
The Tibetans gave the Nepalese uh, a number of extra you know, rights. You know, first thing was also Nepalese uh, with them, you know, like certain crimes in Tibet could be judged by a Nepalese court with the litigation. But uh, the, the, the Nepalese were obliged to also help Tibet when Tibet was being attacked by a foreign state. In 1910, when the uh, when the Manchus, uh, sort of the Tarfans army came to Lhasa, and the Dalai Lama escaped to, <laughs> to Darjeeling, and the Tibetans actually approached the Nepalese and said, "Come on, you can help us now." <laughs> and well, the Nepalese didn't want to have anything to do with that. But even after we got back, they still insisted on maintaining the old treaty. So when the communists were going to in invade Tibet. I was told by the government official that they actually signed uh, an extra protocol to the treaty. I'm not too sure where actually the Nepalese government was also scared of communist China in those days <coughs> that they would help Tibet. So you know, it didn't benefit us making you know, our treaties with uh, Nepal, but it's just it's there. You know, it's interesting. Uh, they are actually like. We still have copies of that treaty. You know, I, I think I sent a, a copy of it here. Oh yes, yeah, that's right over there. Yeah. Although it seems to be the photograph of it seems to be cutting off part. The not that one. That's not the one. That's the Mongolian. Oh, I see. Mongolia. Anybody else want to hear a better picture of the Mongolia? Talk about that issue. That's a question. I think the Mongolia is done with that. I mean, as far as the, uh, that treaty goes, but. Uh, it's up a piece with the uh, um, uh, Tibet Mongol Treaty. You know, this, uh, these are treaties that Tibet signed. The difference, of course, is uh, yeah. The difference, of course, and you know, it, it makes it very interesting is that you know uh, uh, Tibet was within the Qing realms at the time of, it, uh, of the Tibet uh, of the Nepalese Treaty, whereas the Tibet Mongol Treaty makes it clear that uh, uh, that was over. And as I said, the first line says, you know, we, we have emerged from under uh, Manchuria. And so, you know, it makes for uh, a difference there. But it's, it, it is interesting that uh, uh, the Nepalese government, it means the treaty. Whatever, you know, I, again, whatever one wants to argue about its validity or something, all of that is moved when you look at the Tibet and Mongol Treaty. Uh, but, but how much of a role did the, uh, having the state relations with Tibet in the Nepali, in strengthening the Nepali government's application to the UN? Um, I think that was just one element there. I don't think it was debated uh, very seriously. And I don't think anybody made a, a big deal about it. You know, one of, you know, one of the problems with the Tibet Mongol, well, both with the Simlun Accord and also the Tibet Mongol uh, Treaty is that uh, um, the Tibetan government in exile, or the uh, Tibetan People's Organization as it uh, 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 renamed itself, um, um, has been very lukewarm about this. You know, documents relating to the uh, Similar Convention have not been uh, allowed out until very recently. Um, as uh, well as uh, Tashi Tiri, who was supposed to uh, uh, have a paper here, he notes in his paper that uh, when the Tibet Mongol Treaty was released, um, the Tibetan government, you know, when, uh, when, when it, the, the archive of document was finally released in Mongolia, several years ago, um, there was a very muted response from, uh, from Dharamsala, which did not want to uh, prejudice its, uh, you know, it, its attempts to negotiate, uh, you, know, to, you know, keeping Tibet within China under certain conditions. And so that didn't come out. So it's, uh, um, it's, it's a very odd situation. I'd just like to provide you a little uh, background with information on uh, treaties and stuff. I'm not going to give you any details, but if you go to Ramzan, R -E -N -G -Z -E -N .net, uh, and you can download this, it's something called Independent Tibet Facts, and you can download it and print it actually oh, in, in, in Chinese, in, uh, in Tibetan, and uh, Hindi, I think there's a number of languages, and, and of course in English, and it gives you a list of all the different treaties, and even images of these treaties, of the uh, origins of the Tibetan national flag, national anthem, provides a whole lot of uh, evidence. And some, you, have, you may find some interesting, like for instance, Tibetan passports. 
You know, we have done that model passport, the Chicago passport in the, in the 40s, the photograph. But Tibetans have been issuing passports much earlier. There's the earliest one I got a copy from Oxford it was in 1680. We had issued it to an Armenian merchant, someone called Hobanus. And this was like just after the third, uh, fifth Dalai Lama had passed away. And this merchant had received the passport. And of course, they couldn't make a copy because it came out in the old book. Someone had in hand engraved it, you know, published it. So there's a whole lot of passport things, and even on the question of maps. A lot of the old maps that you have in the world, you know, whenever there's uh, China's shown, a lot of the early maps show Tibet as a separate entity, as a separate kingdom. The earliest, you know, and the only surviving globe that we have now, the earliest globe is one uh, that's still in Nuremberg. And there, this was made by a uh, map maker for the king of Portugal. And this was made before America was discovered, so you don't even have the United States. This sometimes, I, you know, I use this to certain American academics who, you know, like, you don't love Tibet too much. But at that time, when America didn't exist, you have there, it says, the kingdom of Tibet. Tibet, Ein Königreich in German. So there are all these little you know, snippets of historical information that uh, whenever you know, I put it all together for young Tibetans to use, even made it a little pack that people carry when they're arguing with the Chinese, French, and the other students. But you know, they can come out and and for friends of Tibet, people who are interested in Tibet, you look into some of these things. It's, it's very, very interesting. So do go into Ramzan.net, you know, independent Tibet facts. And more and more uh, information over time will be added. And we might even get out a really good uh, coffee table book, you know, with detailed, you know, high resolution so image of all these things from Tibet. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess just one final word, I know we're winding down, but one final word about the language of treaties uh, and all of this. When the 17 point agreement was signed in May of 1951, as I said, um, some people in the government sold it to the populace as, uh, uh, as a treaty which preserved Tibet's independence. Uh, and the Chinese government, the Tibetans who went there were extremely, uh, uh, if I may say, ill-prepared and naive in a lot of what went on particularly the uh, linguistic issues. Um, uh, there was an article, I mean, for instance, just to give you an idea, there's an article in China's Tibet in the 1990s by one of the translators who made a point of saying that we discovered, I have, I've written about this before, we've discovered that the Tibetans don't even know the name of their own country. Uh, now, what of course he meant was that uh, they, you know, that there was no uh, word in the Tibetan language that had as its field of meaning uh, something encompassing both Tibet and China. There's a word for China, there's a word for Tibet. And so they decided, uh, uh, um, you know, again, this has to do with uh, 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 a lot of the business of, you know, Han and Chinese. They decided that they would simply transcribe the word Dunhua into Tibetan, and they would make that the name of the country of the Tibetans. And Tibet would then be a locality there. When they uh, uh, put this together, the, I mean, there were a number of things that the Tibetans were you know, simply unprepared for and very naive about. They specifically designated the document, the 17 point agreement, an agreement, uh, in Chinese, uh, not specifically not a treaty. The Chinese representatives paid very strict attention to the language that they would use. Because a treaty, if this were to be a treaty, it would be between two equals where uh, two equal states. So they specifically designated this an agreement. The Tibetans were you know, quite oblivious to, I mean, they basically surrendered the uh, semantic field. So that they didn't even think about it. Um, when you look at the Tibetan Mongol Treaty, it is a treaty, it is a chini. You know, it says chini in Tibetan. I mean, it's, it's unambiguous. So again, like the use of the term Rangzen in the treaty, uh, chini, although these things are, you know, a lot of these usages are really just being uh, solidified at the time. At least even then, you know, in 1913, you know, they called the treaty a treaty, and uh, uh, they sort of went, went about it half blind in 1951 with the 17-point uh, agreement. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody here for coming to our conference. Um, and special thanks, of course, to our panelists.
Elias Broey.